Welcome to Shrink Wrap Hawaii. I'm Steve Katz. I'm a marriage and family therapist here in Hawaii. And you are so lucky and I am so lucky because today we're in for a treat, as you might be able to see here. We got some instruments here and we have Patricia Blair, a board certified music therapist here in Hawaii. Welcome, Patricia. Thank you. I'm so excited. Um, you work for a place called Sounding Joy. What is that? That is Hawaii's first and only nonprofit agency promoting music therapy. We, so we provide direct music therapy services to a variety of different clients. Right now we're on Oahu, Maui, and the Kona side of the Big Island. Um, and we also do a lot of community events, outreach. We have volunteers who come and learn about music therapy, so we provide that experience, and we're an internship site for music therapy interns. How did you end up here in Hawaii? In Hawaii? Um, well, I'm from Southern California originally, so I grew up there and got my music therapy degree from Arizona State and did my internship also in the Southwest area. Um, and I came out here just as a result of some personal circumstances with my husband um, who wanted to come over here for grad school and then I also at the same time found Sounding Joy and they had an open position so I was wow. able to start doing my chosen field right and away. What, what made you choose that to do that as your field? Music, um, music has always just been such a big part of my life from when I started like in church choir when I was about six years old and oh. then I grew up doing that um, and started playing clarinet in elementary school and did that all the way up through the end of college. Um, Were you a music major in college? I was, yeah. I studied music therapy actually. So I just music was such a big part of my life and I thought I might want to study music in college and then somehow I read about music therapy and I was interested in that aspect because my younger brother has autism. Um, or he has high functioning autism, so I was kind of interested in helping people with special needs because of my experience with him, and I thought music therapy was a good way to combine both of those things that I was interested in rather than going into performing or education or something. That's so interesting to me that you mentioned about your brother. I find that uh, so often that many of us in uh, that have something to do with counseling have a very strong family connection to it. It's somehow, I don't know, sometimes it doesn't look like that's why we go into it. <laughs> and I wonder if it's unconscious sometimes, but have, so you. Just having some kind of like yeah. experience with. Direct experience. Yeah. Yeah, yeah really close. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And usually, I mean, music, I assume, made you feel good when you were playing the clarinet or singing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely realized that was an area of strength for me, and that's just is something that, I, yeah, I can't exactly explain why I've always loved it. I just have always had a really strong connection. Do you still get a chance to play? The clarinet? Not, well, so, not any, so much. Music, music oh, in general. Well, I mean, that's a big part of my job. I don't use yeah. the clarinet so much, uh -huh. like, in my daily life and in my <laughs> music therapy right. practice, just because it's hard to... Um, to like accompany clients and it's so yeah. fragile and yeah. stuff so I tend no, not when to I use it. No, I said play, I mean music. Um, you do, yeah. yeah. You do that every day with clients. Yeah, yeah. So I get to play like guitar, <laughs> ukulele, the percussion instruments and uh -huh. sing every day with clients pretty much. So do the clients come to you or you go to them or it depends? It's It depends. It's kind of, We do kind of a mix at Sounding Joy. So we have a clinic on South King Street where we have individuals and families and small groups can come to us. Um, and we also go out to a lot of places all over the island and do group sessions like to schools and nursing homes and adult day health centers. Well hospitals, so it's kind of wherever um, we can find a space and wherever there's interest for the clients. How many music therapists are there there? On Oahu, there's four, uh -huh. um, and then Maui, we have two music therapists that we work with, and then one on Hawaii Island. Uh-huh. And so, I guess it depends on the client, but is there a, is there a typical client? Uh, for us, no. no. <laughs> Not really. We have many clients who have autism and developmental disabilities. Uh -huh. um, we work with a lot of like at-risk youth, youth with like emotional and behavioral issues or who are in out-of-home placement or um, or who are homeless or, you know, for whatever, or involved with the juvenile justice system. 
Um, and we work a lot with seniors as well who are like in nursing care or who come to us. And well, it's a really wide range. Yeah, it's a w really wide range of clients. So I'm trying to like, all right, so let's say you've got uh, a kid with some problems in school, maybe he's labeled as at risk in, and he's in the 10th grade in high school. Mm -hmm. uh, is this the kind of client that might come to you? Or would you more be likely to go to the school? It depends. I think in that kind of situation where the client's getting referred like individually by their counselor mm. or something, probably they, we would ask them to come to the office just like logistically because sometimes there's not time during the school day right. and there's not like a good set so what would setting you do that's when, good for when that. Johnny shows up in your office and you're assigned to Johnny. Uh, what would what would happen? Um, I would first try to find out about well, kind of just about his background and interests, and also his interest in music. Like if he has any musical background, uh -huh. or if he has any specific music preferences, um, and also if he has some kind of musical skill or some interest that he's interested in learning, um, to kind of motivate him to participate in the therapy and give some way that he can connect to music. Um, so we always use music that's really somehow personal or preferred by the client like we wouldn't be singing like twinkle twinkle little star <laughs> with or you are my sunshine with the 10th grader you know probably right, I, right. I would ask him kind of what music he's interested in and then use that to engage with him so um, okay so I, this is my background is theater right so i'm going to mm -hmm. be johnny and uh I, i'm here and um i show up and um hi Hi, <laughs> nice to meet you, Johnny. Hi. Welcome to Sounding Joy. Um, can we first start by do, I want to kind of know, you know, when you meet somebody for the first time or when you kind of see your friend or somebody that you know, you would maybe ask them like, how are you doing today? And they would answer. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> that's all right. Yeah. Um, so we're going to do it that kind of activity, but we're going to use music to um, kind of share how you're feeling today. Well, I don't play any instruments. That's okay. I have a lot of instruments that are really easy to, to use, so I'll show you some of those. Um, this is called the kabasa, which you can play like this, or oh, you can shake, fun. and it's, I think it feels good if you like rub it on your arm oh, or something. Cool. Can I try it? Yeah, you can try that one. <laughs> and then I have also a little xylophone that you can just tap however you like, or some shakers. These are shakers. Mm -hmm. yep, those are called cassisi. Cassisi. Yeah. That's fun. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have also a drum. Exactly. Very nice. See, you're a natural musician. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's the other thing. Music experience is not required to participate in this program, to participate in music therapy. We try to just meet the clients wherever they're at. Um, so you can choose one of these instruments that you kind of stands out to you that you can use to express how you're feeling today. Okay. And then we'll just play together. I'm glad you enjoyed it. <laughs> um, so are you still Johnny or are you Steve I'm now? Okay. Uh, <laughs> all right, if I'm still Johnny, what would happen next? Um, I would say, yeah, what, what did you think about that? What were you thinking as you were playing? Well, at first I was, I didn't know what I was doing and I was kind of amazed that you could kind of make a 
thing out of it, a song out of it, or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. um, that was really neat, and then I really got into it and sort of just had fun. Okay, yeah, I kind of noticed that too. You started out playing kind of soft, yeah. like you're kind of unsure, and then you got a little bit more confident as we were yeah. going, and you're playing That's a little amazing. bit louder. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And your body language was a little bit different too. You're kind of sitting yeah. up straighter, yeah. and yeah. Um, so it might do something like that, like just to, first of all, yeah, musically support the client kind of wherever they are feeling that day. And for it's really amazing sometimes how, especially with kids and with youth, that will just like come out through music, whether they intend it to or not. So uh, Mrs. Uh, Tahini sent me here because I get in trouble in school a lot. And mm -hmm. somehow she thought maybe this was going to help me. I mean, that's fun, but is that going to help me? Um, I think it will bring you some awareness to your feelings, and we also can work on developing some, you know, some musical skills, some stuff that you can use as coping skills, like when you're having a difficult time, either mm. like songwriting or learning musical skills, um, kind of whatever you're interested in, or just using, like, learning what music you can listen to or you can think about when you're feeling stressed out or having a uh -huh. difficult time. Um, we also might use music during this program to... Um, help you kind of improve your relationships with your family or with your friends by sharing music with them and having like a positive experience wow. together. That would be fun. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> You're a very easy client. Most people are like, <laughs> I don't want my family to join at all. I don't, <laughs> I'm not interested in that. <laughs> or would be a lot more, yeah, sometimes resistant to like um, just playing the instrument right away. So I might say like, okay, we're going to do a little like call and response or something uh -huh. and we would like play back and forth and like if you just want to hit the drum like one time for your turn then I would play something and then you have the opportunity again to play one time. So would it be b very different if I was say in the second grade? Yeah I think well because your music preferences would be different but also you know developmentally you would be um, at a different level because of because you're much younger than Johnny yeah. um, so we would use different music probably would use different activities depending on what the goals are like um, it might be more a little bit less like structured with you know saying oh so play how you're feeling and just having the therapist like respond to however the child or the client wants to express themselves through music just by making different stuff available um, we might also do more kind of like games through music like sometimes we do like you know take the instrument and one person's the leader and they say go and then you play the instrument and then they say stop and you stop and then they can kind of you know um also include different dynamics and tempos like if they're working on motor control or, or um sensory issues where they can you know work on playing fast or slow or loud or quiet like with different instruments um and I think doing something like that, where the client is really leading the intervention, gives them kind of a sense of control over their environment mm -hmm. um, and just helps them to feel comfortable to express themselves and have somebody actually listen to them and respond to them to build the it rapport. It also, it's um, sometimes, so as a client, uh, as Johnny say, or as the second grader, it takes away the pressure of having to talk. Yeah, I think that's really one of the amazing things about music. If you're like a client who has difficulty like with communication, like if you have autism or have had a stroke or something, um, or have advanced dementia and, and can't really verbally communicate or carry on a conversation, you can still develop a relationship with someone else and feel supported and feel like you can still express yourself it's just non-verbally um, so music provides that and then also yeah you're right like for for at-risk youth or for kind of anybody who maybe has difficulty like in a traditional talk therapy setting that can be a way that they still can feel um, understood and supported and still express themselves and have like a positive relationship with with the therapist or with other group members speaking of being supportive we have to take a little break uh, we'll be right back with my special guest, Patricia Blair. Don't touch the mouse. Hi, I'm Donna Blanchard. I'm the host of Center Stage here on Think Tech. This show is so very dear to my heart. We talk with artists of various different ilk here about the process that they go through for their art. So we talk about what they're doing, why they're doing it, how they do it. 
and it's a show that is inspiring. This is what I hear from people all the time. And a show that will teach you something, sometimes something about yourself. I hope you'll join us. The show is Center Stage. It's on Think Tech every Wednesday at 2 o'clock. We'll see you then. Hello, ha, how you doing? It's me, Angus McTech, wishing you to welcome and join us to see us on Hibachi Talk on Think Tech Hawaii. Join my co-hosts, Gordo the Tech Czar and Andrew the Security Guy every Friday from 1300 to 1345. We look forward to seeing you. We'll talk tech and we'll have some wee bit of fun. And remember, let your wing gang free wherever you be. Hello, ha. That's we good, they're supposed to come off. Tech. I can't sing. <laughs> But Patricia Blair sure can. <laughs> Welcome back with my guest, Patricia Blair. We're talking about music therapy today. That's what she does. And we were talking about working with school kids. And now I thought we would switch and talk about the other end of life, uh, more towards the, uh, the end. Um, you, do you send people out to care homes? Working with older people? Yeah, we actually we work a lot in that kind of setting. Um, we do both group and individual sessions in that kind of setting. Um, sometimes we'll do, yeah, like in the common area or something of a nursing home, we'll do a group session with whatever clients are there who are interested in participating. Um, and then what we also do. What would a group do, session look like? What would you do? Um, typically we kind of open with some kind of, well this is typical of like any session, we have some kind of like opening ritual, usually it's some kind of like hello song. Like, tell me. Oh. Let's do one. Oh, okay, sounds yeah. good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. sing to each person and either sometimes I like give opportunity to strum the guitar individually during each person's turn or to play like a tambourine or drum or something just to kind of like and this is just like to kind of a for the therapist to remember everybody's names and for the group wow. members to all kind of acknowledge each other and remember each other's names that's wonderful um, but also for for them just to feel like okay I'm here this is the beginning of music you know and it just automatically puts you in a good mood mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah does. yeah and just having that kind of like ritual really especially in like the care home setting where people maybe have issues with um, memory loss and stuff like that and, um, and social interaction that's a good opportunity for for that just to have the routine um, so then you would go around and do John's here and Mary's yeah. here. And yeah, exactly. Oh, and for older adults, we might sing like, Hail, hail, the gang's all here, because they're like familiar with that kind of song, too. So do you do that a lot? Like go back and do music from the time when they were younger? Yes, yeah. As I mentioned earlier, that's like really an important part of music therapy and with any type of age or any type of client um, is using music that they are familiar with. And typically that's music that was popular during your teens and early 20s. Right, yeah, I'm still stuck in you know, <laughs> Bob Dylan and Simon and Garfunkel because that's when I was in my teens. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I think about like, oh, what are people gonna sing to me when I'm in the nursing home when I'm older? <laughs> Stuff that's popular, yeah, a few years ago. Um, but yeah, so so for older adults now, that's music from like the 20s or 30s or 40s or, or 50s even for some people. Um, and then also, if possible, we try to gather information about what type of music people are interested in. Like in Hawaii, there's um, a big Japanese population. Um, so we sing a lot of Japanese songs, like Japanese folk songs and children's songs. So have you had to learn Japanese folk songs? Oh yeah. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Um, and some people are more interested in Hawaiian music or classical uh -huh. music or something. So I mean, really, the music therapist's job is just to become familiar with those kind of music and um, so that they can engage the clients in so when in their I mean it's music. just so much fun and that should be enough reason to do it all by itself but um, when you have to justify to insurance companies or doctors or somebody like so yeah so they're having a good time so what like what what do you say what does it do for the people 
Um, so the purpose of music therapy, or the really the big definition of music therapy, is the evidence-based and goal-directed use of music to achieve um, clinical goals within a therapeutic setting. Um, so we're actually, even though we're like doing these kind of fun activities and just, you know, what looks like, oh, we're singing and playing instruments or we're doing a sing-along, um, we're actually paying really close attention to the clients and how they respond and their current level of functioning and whatever their needs are and then adapting the music to help improve their quality of life and for seniors it would be like to improve or maintain their cognitive skills or physical functioning mm. or their social interaction or communication skills um, and then we do just really detailed documentation like other types of therapy after the session to track how the clients are making progress. Writing notes. Yep. Yeah. 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 Yep and we also video record the sessions often so that we can keep track of kind of just what's going on. That's a great thing to do. Um, do you ever have other issues with confidentiality on the videotaping stuff? Um, I mean, we always have to make sure we have consent from the uh -huh. clients. Like, we don't, it doesn't leave our office at all, the videos. Uh -huh. It's yeah. pretty much only for the therapist use and for our, like, peer supervision and stuff. Uh -huh. um, so we just have everybody sign a consent form and say, this is what it's going to be used for. Um, but yeah, we follow all of the HIPAA regulations and everything that you would do, like, in, yeah. a, in a, another type of therapy or in a hospital setting. Does anybody do music therapy with prisoners, like people in jail? I think people do that, yeah. Um, we have worked before at the Hawaii Youth Correctional Facility. Uh, the one in Kailua? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, as, through like a youth program that we were doing. Uh -huh. um, so we've worked in that kind of setting at Sounding Joy, but I know people do that on the mainland. We just haven't um, had that experience at That'd Sounding Joy yet. That would be a great thing yet. to have over Halava or Triple C, I was mm -hmm. thinking. Yeah, because kind of the same thing, it's like maybe something really personal to people, but it's also kind of like a social, more, maybe more socially acceptable way to engage in therapy, or it's kind yeah. of more, um, helps people to open up a little bit more than yeah. they maybe yeah. would in another setting. So. Right, yeah, like, you know, as a tough guy, I might not talk to you, but play my music yeah <laughs> no but maybe I mean maybe you like learn the ukulele when you're a little kid though or something yeah. and we could use that to kind of well maybe I'd like to learn or... to play the ukulele now that mm -hmm. could be part of music therapy yeah the definitely um, so the the purpose of those type of interventions like learning musical skills is still always the non-musical goals so it's different from like a music lesson in that way yeah. um, but if like learning to play the ukulele is helping with your motor skills or with your attention or improving your self-esteem or or helping you to engage better like in a group setting then that can be part of and also therapy. I mean it just it, I think it can improve my mood more effectively than certain drugs yeah. <laughs> and it's not addictive yeah well, maybe it's addictive but it's a good kind of addiction. <laughs> yeah. So what do you do with um, clients that are really not very responsive, like uh, say in a care home? You get somebody that's not participating. How do you work with that? Well, the neat thing about music is that you don't need to actively participate to get something out of it. So a lot of a lot of music therapists work in like hospice settings and stuff um, where you know the sense of sound is like one oh. of the last senses to or the sense of uh, hearing is one of the last senses to decline at the end of life, I guess. Um, so music therapy can be effective in that kind of setting, oh. even if the client's not able to like you know, to actively participate, um, they still can respond to music. And we would oh. just pay really close attention to, um, to stuff like their facial expression or, or small movements or breathing and mm. stuff to, to yeah, I wonder Notice if you can actually see, responding. like, if there's a monitor, you could probably maybe see the heart rate go down or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's one other thing that I think studies have been done on that kind of thing as well, to see how people's um, different vital signs are responding to music therapy. There's also work with, like, premature infants where they track that kind of thing as well, like oxygen levels and heart rate and stuff, and wow. then see how they respond to music therapy. But, yeah, and it's, it's more challenging to see the response when it's in that kind of setting, but... Um, but yeah, it still can be effective even if the client's not able to actively participate. Like maybe they still can make decisions about what kind of music they want to hear. Like we'll give, you know, two choices or something. I have one um, client who I'll say, okay, what instrument do you want to try or what do you want me to play? And can you just look at 
the, the one that you want to hear. Um, and that way she's still able to kind of engage um, mm. and, and to have some sense of like control over the session. Um, and then I'll just say like, oh, I'm going to play, you know, I, or just play like part of a couple different songs and see kind of her response, like when she, if she smiles or nods or something in mm. response to that, even though she's nonverbal. Without, you know, violating any confidentiality, mentioning names or anything like that. Can you tell me about an interesting case that you've worked on with a client? Oh, um, I had one client who was in like a group home setting who was a teenager and saw her maybe, maybe like 10 sessions during the whole time that we were doing the program in this facility. Um, but we did like a songwriting intervention one week and it was kind of just like a fill in the blank thing, really like user friendly that was based on a song that that client had requested. And this is in a group setting, by the way. Um, so everybody kind of, you know, filled in their part of the song based on like some little prompts kind of. This is like uh -huh. to a familiar song too, like I think it was a this was a group setting? song. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, but everybody did it um, individually and then kind of shared their songwriting. Um, and I think this particular client felt really so like empowered by doing that that she in between the sessions that we had, she like wrote her own verses of the song and oh, then she wow. brought them to the group the next time and oh, shared cool. them. And that was really incredible to see how much her self-expression and her like connection with the therapist and the group and also just her self-esteem and her like personal confidence improved. In the, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 like high school age. Uh -huh. I can't remember uh -huh. exactly how old so she you was. So you took a tune by Eminem and then just plugged in different words? Yes, yeah, yeah. or the clients plugged in different uh -huh. words that were kind of stood out to them, I guess. <laughs> it must have been an edited version of it. I mean, some of Eminem's songs I hear are pretty risque. Yeah, I mean, we it, is, it is a little bit difficult with that population. We try to say, okay, keep it appropriate, like, for this group. And most, most kids are pretty um, compliant with that, where they'll keep it appropriate. Yeah. Um, kind of knowing that we're there and, like, what the group is for and stuff. Um, but, yeah, I thought that was, like, that made me feel really good as a therapist that like she learned this tool in the group and then was able to take it outside and yeah. can use that to, you know, she can, I don't, I don't know what she's doing now, but she can use that even now to uh -huh. help express herself and, and just to get her feelings out there yeah. to kind of, and to improve her confidence. She like took that skill I was just thinking about the group. Some, I don't know Eminem very well, but the little I've heard, I think, he had some, or has some issues with his mother or his parents or mm -hmm. something like that, and that came out in the lyrics. And I'm sure a lot of the kids that you work with have similar issues. Yeah, it is kind of interesting to see um, people's choice in music and kind of, yeah, I, I try not to like super overanalyze it, yeah, but, but just yeah. to kind of notice like what, what kind of music they're interested in and kind of what it might be saying about them. Sometimes we'll do like kind of just a song sharing activity too, again with appropriate lyrics or with the edited version. Asking people their favorite songs. Yeah, yeah, or just have like one client who's kind of highlighted for that week in the group who will bring some song that they really like and then share, you know, what's significant about it to them and that way um, they can share that part of themselves with the group and it also is good, a good tool for the therapist to kind of know a little bit more about their tastes as well. But you think it's such a small thing, but it can be really significant for yeah. them to share. Yeah. We will be right back after this one minute break. Uh, we'll return with Patricia Blair, music therapist. Stay right there. Aloha. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. My name is Josh Green. I'm the host of a program called Healthcare in Hawaii. I'm a physician. I work in the emergency department on the Big Island. I also serve in the state senate, which please don't hold that against me, doesn't detract from my television program. We speak about all the big health care issues in the state. We get together on Tuesdays from 2 o'clock till 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And we try to talk about the most important issues in health care. This is a terrific venue for people to learn about health care. There are many programs on this, on this station. We broadcast it later, uh, not just on the internet, but also on OC16. Thanks for joining us. Please be informed health care consumers. Aloha, I'm Kawe Lucas, host of Hawaii is My Mainland, here on Think Tech Hawaii every Friday at 3 p.m. We address issues of importance for those of us who live here on the most isolated landmass on the planet. Please come join me Fridays at 3 p.m. Mahalo.
We're back. This is Patricia Blair, and we were talking about some of her more interesting clients. But before we do that, if so this sounds great. If I wanted to avail myself of your services, how would I get in touch with you? Um, you can go to our website, which is soundingjoymt.org. It's MT as in music therapy. Uh -huh. um, we have also a Facebook page, and our phone number is 593-2620. 593-2620. Yes. Here on Oahu. Mm -hmm. right. Yep, and then you can also call that number to be connected on the neighbor islands as well with the staff people over there. Okay, thank you. Yep. And tell me another story. Um, so I had one client, this was in a school setting, like in a special education class, um, and we did this kind of intervention like go and stop, as I told you about uh, earlier, like, um, one, like yeah, with the group setting. Yeah. Um, and some of the clients were like, like different um, levels of ability. I guess some of them could say like go and stop, but some needed more assistance or, um, or they needed you know, prompts to say go and say stop, so the students actually led the intervention as well, and then also had to kind of work on their impulse control and taking turns to, uh -huh. to not play after they say stop or, or when it's someone else's turn. Um, so there was one client in that group who um, I got the opportunity to talk with his parent on the phone and like as the group was going on and she said he was having like difficulty getting off of the school bus safely and like being able to walk across the street to their house I guess. Um, so. I don't know who initiated it, if it was her or it was some other caregiver said like, okay, we're gonna go. But somehow the client said like, ready, set, go. <laughs> and then went across the street with her. Oh, so cool. so the parents started using that to, um, to help to get him to cross the street safely and to go when she says go and stop when she says stop, which is also another, you know, I don't always get to see those kind of like carryovers into the client's yeah. life because I'm not with them all the time. I'm with them for, you know, an hour a week. Um, but so, yeah, I thought that was a cool... skill that most of us take for granted, mm -hmm. right? You don't think that that's a skill that needs to be taught. But yeah, this is sort of a life. <laughs> yeah, especially in that thing where it's like a skill. safety concern. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was really neat to hear that, oh, that that little, you know, that activity that we did during the music therapy session helped him to learn that skill. And it's not something you would intuitively think, oh, that's something you're going to learn from music therapy, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I'm sure you have a lot of surprises like that. Yeah, yeah, so that was just like you said, there. you're asking me about a particularly interesting case, so yeah. that's one where, yeah, I, I was really surprised how that affected that kid's life, but it was really significant, so. So do you have to, um, prepare ahead of time for each different kind of setting and client? I mean, how do you do that? What? Typically by becoming familiar with whatever um, music the clients are interested in. Uh -huh. um, it kind of depends on the setting and the clients, like how much I prepare for it. Sometimes we have clients and they're kind of working on improving different skills and so they'll do kind of the same activities every week so that they can work on these specific skills or so that um, the music therapist can measure their progress in, in like the same activity repeating it. Um, so in that case there's not as much planning except when we're doing like the treatment planning for the goals mm -hmm. um, but then if a client like requests a specific song and I'm not familiar with it then it's time to go to YouTube yeah, yeah, and yeah. to print out the lyrics and learn the How chords lucky and stuff. These days. Yeah. yeah I know I don't know what music therapists <laughs> did back in the day. Um, um, I'm just thinking yeah. about the uh, physical dexterity portion because you know I was trying to learn the ukulele and mm -hmm. I feel like I don't have it, right? Like, it takes a lot of mm -hmm. practice. And, you know, I'm not um, officially disabled, but I'm kind of musically disabled <laughs> in that it's really hard for me to learn that, but there must be uh, people, I, I know there are people that have real issues with, uh, I don't know what you call it, manual dexterity mm -hmm. that would benefit from doing something like learning ukulele or something even simpler than that. Yeah, no, that's definitely an application um, where I've seen clients find motor skills improve through through doing stuff like that, like learning a chord on the guitar, or learning ukulele, or, or playing piano and using the fingers separately or something. Yeah. Um, but for clients who are not able to do that, we also have like adaptive instruments or we'll kind of use s certain instruments that don't, um, 
that you don't need to have that much motor control to uh -huh. use so that they still can feel successful in the session and can maybe work up to that eventually. Right. Um, if that's what their goal is to improve motor skills, then we might, you know, use like a mallet like this and have like a cuff or something that would help them hold it um, uh -huh. and then eventually work up to being able to grasp this little thing. Yeah, do you get a lot of clients uh, with like cerebral palsy where they, they have f trouble with fine motor? We have stuff? some, yeah. 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 Yeah, and I think having the setting of music and having it be kind of like fun and motivating is a good yeah. way to encourage them to do stuff like that. And it can also be like relaxing too for some clients who maybe have difficulty where their muscles are really tense or something. It can help them to, yeah. um, to either not focus on it so much, but also just to, yeah, to enjoy it. Do they it, get to up and relax. dance around sometime when the music is happening? Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it depends on the clients, but uh -huh. yeah, I mean, there's a whole wide range of response. And then I find like the younger clients um, often are less like inhibited than adults uh -huh. sometimes, where they, sure. where, yeah, where I mean, they just like really respond to music in a really natural way. But uh -huh. I think as adults, we kind of learn like, okay, that's not really socially acceptable to right. get up and dance. So you, as a th as the therapist, if you're working with a kindergartner or something like that, and they get up and dancing. That's totally okay. I mean, if they're working on like attending to some other task or something, uh -huh. then we might try to redirect them right. through, through music or verbally or physically. Um, but uh, in general, we would just try to respond and support them in their expression what, through what music. What about like people, adults, I'm thinking of uh, dealing with depression? Does, is music therapy have an application? Um, I think so. I haven't worked too much with that population with adults, but no. um, I think it can, like in the same way as we did the check-in, it can help them to gain um, just self-awareness through like improvisation and also mm -hmm. to feel supported and connected to somebody else. Um, but also, I mean, music affects the brain in many yeah. ways and yeah. can really improve mood. Um, something, another technique that we use in music therapy is called the ISO principle, where if you have your client come in and they f are feeling just really like super low energy or really depressed or something, you would first play music that would match that current mood right, state right. to oh, acknowledge them. Or, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or, or, you know, sometimes we just like improvise and play chords on piano or something like that and have the, you know, clients either play along or just listen. Um, and then music is so flexible and so expressive that we can gradually change the music to uh -huh. maybe become more up-tempo or more, a little bit more positive or kind of help them to gradually change their mood state by the end of the session. And the same goes for the, for the kid who's, you know, really super excited or really oh, hyper and, and, yeah, and is like running around. Yeah, exactly. We can, you know, maybe would match that energy level at first and then kind of um, de decrease the tempo and the uh -huh. volume to, so that they can become a little bit more calm. Do you have a favorite population you like to work with? Oh, gosh. I don't know. I like working a lot with... Um, with adults and seniors, like in the nursing home setting, and then adults like with in like adult day health setting, and then just w also with kids with developmental disabilities, kids and adolescents. It must be fabulous when you start to see some progress. Yeah, yeah. it's very, very rewarding, definitely. I mean, you, you probably have some surprises sometimes, like that ready, set, go <laughs> thing, right? right? But mm -hmm. I mean, even right there in the session, probably sometimes people do things you don't expect. Oh, exactly. Yeah, I, I'm always, I think it's really, it's really rewarding for me to hear like the client's voice for the first time, like the first time they vocalize or sing along to a song or something like that. And music just like stimulates that in so many different ways and stimulates the communication and vocalization. And then we can support that through music. Um, so in that, that's always I find really rewarding it to must, help clients must, improve the communication music skills. Music must be very uh, specific to a certain part of the brain because, I mean, I've got a terrible memory, but uh, my wife has a much better memory than I do. I can't remember, you know, what I had for breakfast, but she's always, like, amazed that I have all of these song lyrics in my head mm -hmm. from hundreds, if not thousands of songs going <laughs> back from when my mother would sing to me or you know, when I was a teenager, all those songs that got locked in there or the commercials that I heard when I was a kid. Yeah. <laughs> they're still there, you know, and I think, like, even if I, you know, 
have all kinds of dementia. Those, those, those jingles will still be there. Yeah, well, music is really strongly tied to memory, which is why it, it's, it's so effective with that kind of population, maybe who don't respond to other kind of interaction or, yeah, or have difficulty recalling memories. But music can really stimulate that and kind of help that person to reminisce or to recall different memories from a certain time period. Um, but music is actually processed in a lot of different parts of the brain, which is oh. why it's so effective at helping people to build all these different skills. Um, like with clients who have like brain injury or stroke or something, like yeah. like um, you know, like speech and language are processed in a really specific part of the brain. Yeah. yeah. Like, so if that area is damaged, then yeah. it's difficult for them to you know to improve those skills again and to gain back the communication skills um, but since music is processed in so many different areas it can be used to kind of make new connections in oh, the brain wow. and to help build those skills in different ways do you often work with uh, stroke victims not too much I have mm -hmm. only a couple clients that are in that kind of population but um, very interesting to see That's how music can improve their communication. Yeah. So that maybe they can learn new pathways that will eventually help them speak again? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that can oh. kind of help with the recalling certain words and improving the fluidity of speech and stuff like that. That's I mean, what other I should music have done therapists. to study. I should have yeah. made <laughs> songs out of all my notes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it can help with that kind of thing, really. Yeah, yeah it's just. It, no, it's just really weird. I mean, I really remember commercials from when I was, you know, nine years old. Mm -hmm. I think that's why that's such an effective marketing tool, honestly, right. the jingle, is because it really sticks in there and it's really strongly tied to people's they memories. Know that, yeah, and it can just pop in at any time, too. Right, or if somebody so. says a certain phrase, I'll quote the commercial or something like mm -hmm. that, right? Or just before, I was quoting, you know, like talking about Bob Dylan and Paul Simon, how. Like, I'll think of some Paul Simon song that I used to sing when my daughter was little and we would go dancing around the living room together while I was playing Graceland, mm -hmm. right? Or I would sing it in the car with her. And to this day, if, I, if I'm in a bad mood and I put that music on, it's like, boom. Or I'll put the music on from West Side Story. Cause, yeah. <laughs> you know, I was 10 years old when that was happening. And, you know, I just want to get up and dance and mm -hmm. sing along. And I know all the words. And I don't know how because, like I said, I can't remember anything about yesterday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's really the... I mean, most people have that kind of experience with music, honestly, where they think, oh, it really is strongly tied to my emotions or to memory and stuff, and they have this kind of personal experience with right. music and know like how important it is um, and how it can inf affect people in so many different ways. But but then kind of, so I, I think people understand the power of music and, then we, just, and then we just use that, um, you know, to in order to help people in more kind of measurable ways and to help with really specific areas, which is why we study music therapy. Well, I've been having such a good time, but I don't want to miss getting uh, your contact information because I'm sure there's people that would love to have your services. Can you repeat them again for us? Sure, yeah. If you're interested in learning more about music therapy or um, receiving services yourself for you or someone that you know, please go to our website, soundingjoymt.org, or call us at 808-593-2620. Thank you for coming, Patricia Blair, music therapist, and thank you for joining us once again for another fabulous session of Shrink Wrap Hawaii. I'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you.